words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Well, um, I'm standing here because of Gary Moon. So just remember that when this thing tanks. <laughs> um, you ready for one last talk? All right. Um, my first encounter with Dallas's theory of salvation was as an undergraduate, and I was employed as a uh, research assistant for a professor who um, got people like me to read books that he didn't have time to read. So at $10 an hour, I was assigned The Divine Conspiracy. So if you're looking for a strategy to get other people to read Dallas's books, <laughs> I've got something for you. Uh, well, I should say, I, you know, I, was a, I grew up a Presbyterian. I went to a strong evangelical college and I was a Christian education major. I was taking a lot of my electives in Bible and theology, and I was even in the middle of a course in historical theology. And so I say that to say I knew what I should uh, think about salvation as a good evangelical Presbyterian, and I knew also what, that there were alternatives. Um, but when I read The Divine Conspiracy, I knew Dallas is different, really different. Now, some things made immediate sense to me. Um, it made immediate sense to me that uh, Jesus, when he came, um, did a lot of things before he went to the cross. Uh, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. He, in hand in hand with that, took disciples. And uh, these were not extracurricular activities for him. That made a lot of sense to me. Other things didn't make a lot of sense, such as, uh, you know, Dallas would say that what Jesus did while he was on the earth, he still does now. And he even does it, if I may say, better than he did it while he was confined to a tunic. So that made me wonder, what then is the purpose of the incarnation? I mean, why restrict yourself in that way? See, I, Dallas didn't doubt the Incarnation, and I, I knew that, but it just, its place in God's plan didn't make any sense to me. Well, I knew what my evangelical mentors had told me. They told me that uh, God had become man because we needed a God-man to die on the cross. But you see, Dallas, Dallas wasn't saying that. And so I knew he wasn't doubting the cross, but it just didn't, it just didn't, makes sense. It wasn't the, it wasn't the, the cross wasn't the hinge of the incarnation any more than the feeding of the 5,000 was the hinge of the incarnation. Well, uh, fast forward 10 years, I've spent five of those years working with uh, two churches on sort of spiritual formation, Christian education thinking, and another five of those years uh, just basically reading theology and spiritual classics from all the ages. Now I'm in the middle of a PhD on Karl Barth and Martin Kaler, and after prayer and pastoral guidance, I've decided that I'm going to do something stupid. I'm gonna tell my PhD supervisors that I wanna change my topic and write on Dallas Willard. Now you have to understand Everybody that I know in high-level theology, if they know Dallas at all, they think of him as a nice man who wrote nice books. So philosophical realism, it's the 20th century, and we, we just got to have something more in style. Edmund Husserl, I think I remember him from my philosophy classes, but it's just some abstruse philosopher that we don't read anymore. The Gospel of the Kingdom, well, we have our own historical interpretation of that. Disciples, discipleship, disciplines. Okay, now Dallas, thank you. Thank you for that inspirational talk. But now we theologians need to get back to serious theological topics 
And for that, we're interested in people who are not just nice, but are brilliant. But I persevered in my stupidity <laughs> because I had read Dallas's philosophical writings, and I knew um, he wasn't just nice. He might be wrong, but he wasn't just nice. He was brilliant. And so I got the chance then to just ask some of these fundamental questions that I had of his theology. And so here's what I want to tell you today. What you are seeking in the life of Christ depends a lot on what you, are, what you find in the life of Christ, depends a lot on what you are seeking. So obviously some things aren't there. Um, if you're looking for somebody whose dreamy eyes and smoky voice are going to make them the next teen heartthrob, you won't find that in Jesus. But some things really are there. If you are under the influence of evil spirits or idols or persons with superhuman power, Jesus can help you. If you are ill or in deep trouble of some kind, Jesus can help you. If you are oppressed or compassionate towards those who are oppressed and you need inspiration and encouragement to continue in that struggle, Jesus can help you. If you uh, need, don't know where to go and you need some sort of inspiration or re revelation from on high, then Jesus can help you. And if you, like me, are distant from God and are burdened by guilt and shame, then Jesus can help you. You have to understand it's like as if all of humanity is a part of those needy crowds following Jesus around. And they just are looking for his ad hoc help. Jesus, help us with this. And he helps them. And he still helps us that way. And for you theologians, um, this is actually in the life of Christ where Dallas locates atonement and forgiveness in the ad hoc ministry of Jesus, helping people in need. And we come to him, or he comes to us, and we, because of our sin, need reconciliation with God, and Jesus says, child, your sins are forgiven. But you see, there's another way of looking at the life of Christ, and that's through the lens of what God is seeking. See, Dallas was a scholastic theologian. Um, you may not, that may not be your first impression when you uh, read his books, because thank God he didn't write like a scholastic theologian. <laughs> but he thought like one. He thought like one. And uh, the heart of scholastic theology, um, well, the heart of the it's not, scholastic theology is really not about trying to stamp out all mystery in our relationship with God. And neither is it about trying to dismiss careful and even historical exegesis of the text. The heart of scholastic theology is uh, about saying, well, two things. First, um, that the nature of God and uh, his eternal purposes can be known because God revealed them to us. And second, that the rules of logic and the findings of metaphysics do not cease to be true when we enter the field of religion or work with ancient texts. So um, that, what that means for theology is that our experiences with God, no matter how wonderful they are, and our exegesis of the text, no matter how insightful that is, need to be appropriately subordinated to what we know, a revealed knowledge of the nature of God and his eternal purposes. All right, enough on scholastic theology. What is God seeking? What are God's purposes? Well, um, in 1971, a long time ago in a little Quaker church, with a man named Richard as pastor. A man named Dallas said this. I'll read it to you. Some people have actually memorized it. And I'm sure if we asked the man named Richard up here, he could tell us what he said. God's aim in history 
is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with himself included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. Heard that before? That's probably because the man named Richard liked it so much and kept quoting Dallas on it. Um, but Dallas actually modified it a little bit as he got older. Here's how he said it in 1989. God is going to create a community of loving, creative, intelligent, loyal, faithful, powerful human beings. And they are going to rule the earth. Do you hear the difference? He's included more of the character of that community, and he's also included what he called the human vocation, reigning in this universe. Now that is what God is seeking. That's what God is seeking. Um, and that is why he created a world and put in it creatures like us, made in the divine like us. But we sinned. We sinned, and there is now need for reconciliation with God. God grieves our sin. He had good reasons for letting it happen. He, had good reasons for, he has good reasons for still letting it happen, but we did it, and uh, we need reconciliation with God. Um, but here is where we have to be scholastic theologians, like Dallas. Because, see, from the perspective of uh, what God is seeking, see, if I may put it this way, um, God's biggest problem is not that he needs reconciliation with his creatures. God's biggest problem uh, is, that how, is, is the question of how to get cosmic rainers out of mundane sinners. And let me tell you, that is not a simple project. It's complicated, uh, and that's okay. Um, in the interest of TED Talks, I'll summarize. Uh, but suffice it to say, God began with Abraham. And yada, 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 <laughs> a lot of salvation is happening before Jesus comes. Now, yes, Tremper, I just yada yada it over the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yes. <laughs> so, browdy points there for the using the Hebrew. Okay, well, um, <laughs> but salvation doesn't kick off with Jesus. Um, and, and also, God's people aren't just hanging on prefigures and promises. So Dallas thinks of salvation in the Old Testament uh, period um, in terms of two things. First, regeneration. It's really a, a big deal for Dallas. Um, salvation as a new life, however, wasn't new with Jesus. God was with his people. Um, he was with individuals, mystically, if you will. And also the other one, uh, deliverance. Um, Jesus doesn't invent miracles. He doesn't invent answers to prayer. Psalm uh, 118 says, out of, um, out of my distress, I called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered me and gave me a prefigure of Christ. No, it says, he set me free. He set me free. Um, now, so what, what God is doing in waiting then so long for to send to come as uh, um, in flesh is he is um, trying to prepare a people in, in, in knowledge and in character and power so that when he does come, that, that people can actually recognize him. And when he does come, um, what he does is he continues the two classic Old Testament forms of salvation, regeneration and deliverance. And, of course, that helps a lot with the recognizing part. But, see, even that isn't the main reason why God is walking around in sandals. Um, 
What God is doing is he is preparing. No, what God is doing is he is trying to get a better breed of cosmic rainers. And uh, what he does is he, um, he, he, he gets basically a, a, a small group of, of people, Jewish nobodies, really, but nobodies with the prerequisite knowledge, and he invites them into a relationship with himself, a distinct learning space, and that begins a psychological redemptive process which results in their whole life transformation. So that is why God became man, to uniquely contribute to the spiritual formation of a small group of Jewish nobodies. Or were you hoping for more? <laughs> See, many Jews were too. So we humans, Jews and Gentiles, think that we know God. And we think that we know ourselves well enough to know how this God should save us. But our ignorance goes to the core of what has been wrong with us since the fall. See, at the fall, we put knowledge of God aside and lost thereby genuine knowledge of ourselves. And this is why God became man, to uniquely contribute to the spiritual formation of a small group of Jewish nobodies. Well, there are two things. I just want to kind of conclude with this sort of unique contribution. What was the unique part of this contribution? Well, um, see, spiritual form tra transformation, that's God's project all through human history. But the unique part, there's really two things that Dallas will say. Well, there's a few things, but the two things that really are important to say. One is, um, first, Jesus shows through his life and his existence what, who you really are. Um, there's this ancient creedal uh, statement, uh, vera Deus, vera homo. And actually, in order to confess that, you might think about the fact, you might actually need to know what sort of the true God really is, or true man, in order to really say that. Well, um, that's a problem for us moderns, because we moderns tend to think that we, we know the, the vera homo part, true man. We've got that one down. We know what that means. And, and Dallas says, with Jesus, no, we don't. We need Jesus to come as an instantiation of perfect human existence, to be true humanity for us, to reveal what that really is. And so second, the other thing is, uh, you're probably expecting this coming here, um, Jesus shows in his life and existence who or what God really is. Now this is a hard one for Jews because Jews knew, and they were very right about this, that they had the best theology that the world had ever seen. It's just so much better than the pagan alternatives. And when Jesus comes, he just comes uh, and, and needs to really refine that. And so what he does is um, he has this sort of, tries to help them recognize who he is. And when he just gets a little bit, I mean, they don't, they just sort of, Suppose this guy might be pretty close to God. He gets a foothold, and then he's able to start to refine what their knowledge of God really is. And he does that here, Dallas would think, in terms of two things, in terms of God's power and in terms of God's righteousness or his love. And the unique mission is successful. God gets what he is seeking. 12 to 120 people are... Um, become a nucleus of this sort of all-inclusive community, and uh, they uh, then kind of receive a spiritual formation from Christ through that. And this work goes on because 
God is still seeking people to be part of that all-inclusive community. And they are, um, they are witnesses to us of that. And that's Dallas on Salvation. <laughs> <laughs>